I was really thankful during my Thanksgiving table. I thanked God for all of you. And I also want to just honor, you know, I like to mention about honoring different people. And as I was thinking about that during Thanksgiving, I thought, how good would it be to honor those who have passed? I don't know about you, but there have been a lot of godly people who have died in the Lord who I look up to, and I thought, my life is completely different because of how they lived their life and how they ended their life in death. And so I want you to take a moment and think about those people and, think, and thank God real quickly and say thank you for letting those people who have died in the Lord, who have impacted our lives, and just be thankful to them. One of the things that we're going to be mentioning here in a moment is I want to tell you about a few things that are going to be happening in the next um, week or so. Starting next week, we're, we're going to have some, actually starting this Wednesday, we're going to be starting a new class called Writing Your Love Story. It's going to be a class on marriage. And as we know, marriage is breaking down. A lot of people are struggling in marriage. And I want to encourage everyone to come to this class. If you're not coming to a Bible class, I encourage you to come to this one. Even if you're not married or if you've been widowed or even if you're not thinking about getting married, you're going to learn a lot about your relationship with God, a lot about your relationship with each other, and also how to encourage and advise other people who may have some marital struggles. How, what would you tell them if they said, I'm struggling in my marriage and I need help? What, what would you say? Well, this is a class that would help equip you to teach you on some of those things. And I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective from a biblical standpoint about marriage. And I'm going to be making some really bold statements from, about marriage. Some that you may not have heard before or some that you may think are completely outrageous, but I find them to be very biblical. And so if you want to hear these bold statements that I'm making that everyone will be talking about and you don't want to be left out, then you need to come to this class. Also, starting next Sunday, Tony's going to lead us in a really good class on um, our LTC books. You know, LTC is a big event that our, we're teaching and raising our kids to grow up in the Lord. But as an example of that, Tony is going to be showing us and leading the adults and leading the example of really learning about these books. And we're going to really learn a lot from Tony. Tony always does a great job. So I want to encourage you about that as well. <coughs> I had a... I kind of revamped the intro to my sermon um, last night. Because I was thinking about this concept of reciprocation replication. And I was just thinking about this one time when I went to a preacher seminar. And this older gentleman, been preaching longer than I had been alive, came up to me and said, You know, I'm really struggling with the congregation. It seems like our congregation's struggling, it's getting smaller, it just seems like it's not making a difference. And he said, well, what do you think we should be doing? What do you think we should be focusing on? What do you think we should be emphasizing a little bit more? Is there something that we have taught before that we're not teaching as much today that we should be doing? What would you recommend doing? And I told him, yeah, actually, there is something on my heart that I believe that this generation is missing. Something that I believe that the church has done a good job teaching at one time, but we've kind of fallen away from because we're fearful of it. And even to a degree, we've even taught it, but maybe we have taught it from a wrong perspective. The older I get, the older I realize it's more about having a biblical perspective, but also the right kind of perspective because you could take something very biblical and turn it into something that it wasn't meant to be. You can do that from a standpoint of liberalism. You can do it from a standpoint of legalism. But one of the things that we always want to do is, are we looking something at the core of what the Bible is actually saying? <coughs> the thing that I'm referring to is holiness. Holiness as a lifestyle. You know, this is a subject that is not very popular to teach in churches today. It's not popular to teach in our culture, but I think it's one of the things that is ne being neglected. And I believe, and I'm very passionate about this, that holiness is one of the keys that we're going to revamp the church again. 
You know, we've kind of plateaued, we've kind of struggled since the 80s, and a lot of scholars and professors that I've talked to said, we just don't know why, and I believe in my heart that one of the reasons is because we've neglected to teach the doctrine of holiness. And some people have, and when I was talking with this older gentleman <coughs> about this, and he said, well, Micah, that's not a popular thing to teach. You know, I see all these big, bigger churches and they have these praise bands and they have all the entertainment things and they have all those different things that attract activities, the social events and all the different things that attract people. And they're getting the numbers, but we're not doing that. And I looked at the guy and said, you know what? One of the things that we need to be focusing on is being like Jesus. And if you ask who, at the core of who Jesus is, who is he? And what is he? You know, throughout the New Testament, he's called the Holy One of God. And I think we have to remember that. And I think one of the things that we struggle with is understanding the essentiality and the importance of holiness. And I told him, you know what, you can do a lot of things that really impress people. I can entertain you. I can make you cry. That's easy. I can make you laugh. I do that occasionally. Different things like that. that that's not hard. I can draw a crowd. You don't put boundaries on me, I can fill this room up. Not, not hard to do. But I want to do things God's way. And sometimes that's a little bit harder to do because then we take out the human element of it and we have to do things by God's own power. <coughs> And holiness is something that I believe because, you know, Mike Flynn mentioned in class today about hypocrisy and how you can fake it. You can, you can, hypocrisy is playing the role of an actor. You can fake being religious. But true holiness, you can't fake. True holiness, you can't hide from God because God knows the hearts of all people. He knows who you are and why you do what you do and what you believe and how you act. And he hits to the core of who you are. And I believe this is one of the reasons why God emphasizes time and time again about holiness. And holiness is a hard subject to teach because in order to teach holiness, you've got to teach some really hard things like sin. Is that popular to teach about today? No. What about repentance? Saying, you know what, you're living wrong, but you've got to change your mind and live completely differently. Is that popular to teach? No. And we see that the church has kind of gone in that direction of we want to appeal to the world so we'll just be the world. But one of the things that I think our world is craving for is the world is craving for a people that will be like God himself. And when the people of God will finally rise up and be like God, then people will get, wake up and see there's something different about those people. You know, one of the things that... Mm, I told him, is this, this older preacher is, you know, we can, we can make holiness. And we've taught holiness from a wrong perspective. We've made it about a list of rules, what you can do and can't do. You mention holiness and people are like, oh, so you're telling me I can't have fun. You're, you're telling me i got to be boring. you got to tell me that I just have to just pretend to be this holy and righteous person. And I said, No. No, that's the wrong perspective of holiness. If that's how you view holiness, you're going to hate holiness. But what if we wrote, rewrote the perspective? What if we rewrote the question? <coughs> what if we took the Bible's definition of holiness and kind of applied it to our lives? Because one of the things that we understand about holiness is holiness is actually the message of hope. You know, a lot of the reason why I teach people about Jesus Christ and they accept the gospel and they're hearing about this great grace and is, why is holiness so important? It's because it's saying, you have a second chance. Is there something in your life, when you look at your life and your history, that you said, you know, I've hurt people. I, there's things that I've been guilty about. There's things that I regret. And if I could go back in time, I would have done things all over again. Do you have those things in your life? We all do. But holiness is a message of hope because it says, you know what, that person who you were, you don't have to be that person anymore. God has washed the slate clean. He's given you that second chance. 
The person who you were does not have to define who you are for the rest of your life. So instead of being sinful old you in the past, you could be like God in your future and in your present. That's why holiness is a message of hope. You know, when I Bible study with people, <coughs> a lot of people I've converted are some of the people we would probably not want to spend time with. Some of the people that we would consider the worst of sinners. Ex-cons, prostitutes, thieves, and things like that. But when I finally break it down to them and say, you know what, there's another option to the way that you have lived your life. And it's a holy life. It's a life that is brought about because of the grace of Jesus Christ. You'd be amazed at how these people just break down and they'll cry. And they're just like, I can be new. I can be different. I can be better. And that's one of the things. You always ask people, they say, I want to be the best version of myself. Well, isn't the best version of yourself like Jesus? Isn't the best version of yourself a holy life? And is holiness not fun? Is sin the only way that we would define fun? I tell people sin is not fun. It may be pleasurable for a moment, but guess what? Sin is what destroys marriages. Sin is what has caused you to feel belittled when you were a young child and maybe you got criticism or hurt by your peers or by your parents. Sin is what's causing people to hurt one another. Sin is the main problem that we're dealing with. ISIS is a bad, but sin is worse. Holiness is that which helps thwart that brokenness, that struggle, that hurt that is caused from sin. A life of holiness is a good life. Isn't that the life that we aspire to? The best life you could live is a holy life. You see, that's how we need to rephrase the question. How we need to rephrase holiness. It's a message of hope. It's allowing you to be the best version of yourself. To wipe the slate clean so you don't have to be that old person anymore. You know, I love hearing stories. You know, you know all the Hallmark stories where they always have those rags to riches kind of stories? And we love those stories. We're saps for those stories, those human interest stories. But what, what I love even more than the rags to riches kind of stories is the sinful to redemptive holiness stories. There's some people in my life, some of the godliest people I've met in my life, and when they finally share their life stories, you're like, wow, boy, were you a horrible sinner. But then you see who they are today, and you're like, there's no explanation for it other than God must have been working in your life. How is it that you're the person you are today? How is it that you're so holy? How is it that you're so righteous? I wish when I grow up, I wish I could be just like you. And a lot of people, these people who I mentioned, they're so humble. And they're like, you know what, if you would have known me, you would have thought, I would have never been that guy. I would have never been that guy people looked up to. I would have never been that church leader. I would have never been that one that people say, I wish I was like him someday. Because of their histories in the past. So how, is it, how are they different? They've chosen holiness. You see, when you choose to follow Jesus, you're choosing holiness. It's really in vogue in our culture today, especially in the church culture, to say, you know, we're going to focus on spiritual transformation. Really cool keyword. Sounds great, right? Very biblical. But what does that mean? Or it's just like, oh, we're going to be Christ-like. We're going to be following the likeness of Christ. Okay, what in the world does that mean? How does that really relevantly, applicably, actually mean anything to me? I can say, okay, we're being transformed in the likeness of Christ. Woo, that sounds good. But what, is, what does that actually look like? What it actually looks like is taking that which is unholy to be transformed into that which is holy. And you can tell. Isn't that how we really look at a grow, someone who's maturing and growing in their faith? Is that they're being less like the world and more like Christ. And how do we know it? Holiness. That's how we really see it. And it's really choosing that. It's saying, I'm done being like the world, and I'm choosing to be like God. And who is God? What is God? Holy. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 5 tells us about the imitation of God. But if you're going to imitate God, then it doesn't mean you can be casual about it. 
It doesn't mean you got to change who you are, what you do, what you believe, what you think. And so look at what Ephesians 5, verse 1 to 14 says. It says, therefore, be imitators of God. And how he's going to explain to us what that means, what that looks like. As beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But here's how he's making known. You've got to be different from the world. If you're going to imitate God, this is what you've got to do. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything exposed is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Have you noticed that we have been called to imitate God? We are to be children of the light. And you know that light is symbolic of moral goodness and righteousness. And he's saying, here's the sinful things, and this is why God will come down in just wrath. These are the things where we think, those are shameful things. That list of sins that, that Paul just listed, are those shameful? If you were committing adultery, would you want people to know? If you're indulging in thievery, would you want people to know? Those are things that are shameful. They're discussing the wrong. They don't imitate God. But when you choose to be like God, you're saying, you know what, I'm going to be light. And the fruit of my life, people are going to see. Everyone bears fruit. And people are going to see, what kind of fruit are you bearing? Is it the fruit of sin or is it the fruit of righteousness and of holiness? You know, one of the things why I told this older <coughs> minister why I believe that we need to refocus on holiness again, other than how people need hope, is ultimately because all things about our spiritual life, all things pertaining to the church, always begin first with God. And in order to understand God, you have to understand holiness. And that's why I believe holiness is something that we need to re-understand about God. God is holy. Have you ever said that? We sing that song. Have you woke up this morning and said, God is holy? You know, we say that, but do we really understand the depth of what it means that God is holy? It means He is the supreme being. He's morally perfect. He's righteous. I could always find someone worse than me. I could always point, point your sin and be like, huh. I'm not like Hame over there. I'm not like Lynn. Did you see them, what they did? Well, I mean, and then they could do the same thing for me. But here we have a supreme being that no matter how we compare ourselves to him, he's always better than us. And in fact, he's so perfect that when the people of the Bible saw him, they're like, oh, that's God. I can't be in your presence. You're too perfect. You're too holy. If I look upon your face, I'm going to die. Literally. We can't be casual with the fact that God is holy. That we have a supreme being, the spiritual holy being up there. We can't just say, oh, God is holy. It's like, do you understand all that that means? Because holiness is the core of who God is. You know, I've, I've really researched this and I've studied this and I believe the two core characteristics of the nature of God are love and holiness. All other attributes of God really derive from those two aspects of God. And in fact, holiness and love are parallel to one another. You know, God loves perfect, perfectly because He's perfectly holy. And God is perfectly holy, therefore He loves perfectly. 
they're, they're attributed to each other. Do we understand that God is holy? And doesn't, isn't that why we love Him? Because we know He's righteous and perfect. When God says, I'm going to save you from your sins, if God was unholy, we wouldn't be able to trust that message. But because we know God is faithful, because we know that God cannot lie, because God is holy, we can know without a shadow of a doubt, you know what, even though I'm imperfect, because I'm in Christ, I'm saved. If God was unholy, we would not be able to trust the gospel. But because God is holy, we can trust that message. And this is something we have to learn about God. God and the things of God are holy. And this is one of the reasons why I believe that we have to return to holiness. If you look throughout Scripture, everything of God and everything that is an extension of God is mentioned to being holy. John 17, 11, Jesus makes known that the Father is holy. Acts 3, 14 makes known that Jesus was the holy and righteous one. Acts 1, 8, the Spirit, what's His definition? What's His adjective? It's holy. But look at how God Himself is not holy. He expects everything that is associated with Him, everything that is an extension of who He is, to be holy as well. Psalm 97, verse 12 says, God's name is holy. Psalm 47, verse 8 says, God's throne is holy. Romans 1, 2 says that the scriptures are holy scriptures. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 makes known that Christ's church is holy. Do you see this theme throughout the New Testament, throughout the scriptures, that holiness is the attribute that God is and what he expects anything associated with him, including his people, to be? Are we realizing how essential holiness is? And if God is holy, should we ourselves not also choose holiness? And one of the things that I want to think about here is some people say, what is heaven going to be like? Have you ever asked yourself, what is heaven going to be like? Well, what's it going to sound like? We actually, I can tell you, I know exactly what heaven, I may not know what heaven will look like, but I know exactly what heaven will sound like. And do you want to know how I know this? Because the Old and New Testament. Because we're going to be singing praise with the angels and with the heavenly beings that are in there. This message. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, it says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each with six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and two he, with he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's the message we hear that the angels are singing in the Old Testament. But what about the New Testament? Revelation 4 through 7 through 8 doesn't change much. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And the day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The proclamation of who God is is constantly being said forevermore in heaven because it says they never cease. <coughs> out of all the main attributes of God, what is all of heaven yelling out? Holy, holy, holy. So when we go to heaven one day, guess what we're going to be singing as a chorus to God? Holy, holy, holy. And that's why we love him. God, you're holy in your faithfulness. You're holy in your truth. You're holy in your love. You're holy in your peace. You're holy in your forgiveness. There's not one aspect of God that we hate because of holiness. And in fact, it's because of his holiness that we truly do love him. Are we seeing this life? In this life, are we waking up and are we going to bed at night and we, as we're eating, are we saying, holy, holy, holy is God Almighty? Because that attribute of God is what inspires us to be different. Inspires us to say, God, I love you more. I'm surrounded by unholy people and they hurt me with their sin, but never will you hurt me with your sin, God, because you're holy, holy, holy. You see, everything starts with God. 
the way that we choose to live our life. And this is, the, this is the reason why we're inspired to live life differently than the world. And this is why we have to understand that holy as a standard of living. Do you choose holiness as a standard of living? When people look at your life, do they say, that's a holy person? Because that's what we're defined to be. Remember, the word saint is really meaning one who is holy. And it says all Christians are saints. What, you, what the scriptures are saying is you're called to be living a standard of holiness. That is who you have been called to be. And when you wake up in the morning, we have a choice. What worldview will I choose to live my life? How, what decisions will I make? What lens will I use to see the world through? How am I going to choose to live? Do I want to be holy or do I just want to be like anyone else in sin? I always tell people, sinning is easy. Anyone can sin. Holiness is harder because you're choosing to be like God himself. But isn't that the best life we could live? Would you be proud of your kids if they were holy or sinful? Isn't that how, why you parent them and do the hard things in parenting? Because you want them to be holy. You don't want them to lie. You don't want them to steal. You don't want them to cheat. You want them to be holy. That's your desire. And just like God is a, the perfect Heavenly Father, that's what He's saying for His lovely children. He's saying, I want you to be holy. And that's actually why we have been called. You know, we always think about why, what's the purpose of life? We, we know some things. Relationship with God, we know. We know to do the work God has called us to know, do. We've covered that. But another purpose that God has called us to do is to be like Him, which is holy. Look at these passages of Scripture. 1 Peter 1, 15-16 says, But as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Can you imagine how much different your life and how much the church would be different if everyone followed that simple command? Do you think we'd love each other better? Forgive better? Serve better? It would all be like that. God himself is saying, I'm giving an opportunity to define who I am to humanity and how I'm defining myself is by holiness. So if you're going to be like me, if you're going to imitate me, I'm calling you to be holy as well in all your conduct. Are we holy in all of our conduct? You know, we like to separate, here's my church Jesus Christian holy side and here's everything else. He's got to own the whole pie chart. He's got to own the whole part of your life. Look at this one. Ephesians 1, 3, 3, 4, through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. Guess what? We know that God chose before the creation of the world to save us from our sins. But He also chose us to be holy. But when he chose to forgive us of our sins, what he's also choosing is by forgiving us of our sins, he would be making us holy. God purposed you to live a holy life. You think, what, what is the life that God purposed for my life? It's a holy one. This is why I think we have to get back to the core of this issue. If God purposed, even before the world was made, even before I was even thought of by my parents, God purposed and said, I want Barb to be holy. I want D to be holy. I want Fred to be holy. That's what he purposed in all of our lives. Because that's the best life you could live. It's a holy life. A holy life. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9-10 through 10 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Are we different? Are we a holy nation? Are we God's people? How would people know that we're God's people? By our holiness. Because we are representing God. And we don't take holy, we don't take advantage of grace. 
You know, we could take advantage of grace and say, I have been forgiven, therefore I can indulge in sin. We know throughout the scriptures that's not what God intended. And in fact, what God intended was by receiving mercy, by receiving grace, you would choose holiness. You would choose to do what is right. In Hebrews 12, verse 14, this is a really convicting one. And this is one of the messages why I think we need to emphasize this. We talk about relationship with God. Well, let me tell you this. You cannot have a relationship with God without holiness in your life, without pursuing it. If you're not pursuing holiness, you're not pursuing a relationship with God. Because Hebrews 12, 14 says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You can't fake holiness to God. When God looks at your heart, does He see this person cares about me so much and what I care about and who God is and what God cares about is holiness that you're striving after it. He's not telling you to be absolutely perfect, but you need to strive to be like Him. And in fact, one of the things that He says is you won't see Him. We know sin separates us from God, but holiness, holiness draws us closer to Him. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And when he's talking about the purity of heart, he's not just talking about sexually. He's talking about morally, in view of holiness. Is this person morally holy? And if they are, they will see me. We will have a relationship with one another. This is why I think we need to be teaching this, because so many people will not see the Lord because they don't know holiness. But how can we pursue holiness? How can we choose holiness? It's easy to say, oh, I know I need to be holy, but how do I go about it? I'm really big on this one, next one. And what I'm going to say will probably offend some of you. Some of you will probably roll your eyes. Some of you will probably think I'm being legalistic, whatever it may be. I don't really care. I care more about you and your spiritual life, and I care more about God and Him being glorified. Because I have, I'm, saying this, I'm going to be saying this next thing from a perspective of a marketer, because you know that's my background in marketing, from my background in counseling, and my background as a minister. <coughs> we need to be holy in our influences. And this is something where, when we mention this, Christians roll their eyes. And this is where we're, why we're not choosing holiness. The Bible makes known you're going to fill yourself with something else. You're going to choose to fill yourself with holiness, or you're going to choose to fill yourself with sinfulness. And, the, and what's going to influence you? Do you know who I think is one of the greatest marketers in human history? Well, Satan, yes. <laughs> but human-wise, a man by the name of Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler says this, If you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. Hitler changed a whole nation, affected the whole world, and he understood the power of influence. That's why he took power and control of all influences in, in Germany. And he believed this. He said, if I can influence people, then I'll influence the way they think. And therefore, I influence their behavior and their actions and their worldview. One of the biggest lies that we tell ourselves is that I don't get influenced by sinfulness. I'm not influenced... Do you know how many times I've heard people say, you know, I can watch bad movies, I can listen to bad music, I can go to bad websites, and I won't be influenced. You may be influenced, but I won't be influenced. And the whole time I tell people, you're deceiving yourself. You know, in marketing, one of the first things they teach you is people are so easily influenced. And the reason why they're influenced is because no one thinks they're, in they're influenceable. Did you know that? You'd be amazed at how much marketers know. Have you ever noticed yourself singing a song and you don't know where that song came from? Or where you impulse buy something that you don't really want or need? Marketer, it's scary how much marketers actually know. But it's because of influence. They, they've discovered that our brains are so intelligent that it absorbs information whether or not we consciously choose to or not. And our brains are so intelligent, it can't, it, it can, Remember verbatim information of a news article you read 70 years prior. Our brains absorb information constantly and do so very well. And this is why the Bible has a lot to say about what influences us and how we think. Remember, 
Our influence is important. All the good kings of Israel, what was the first thing they did when they were trying to cause the people to repent? They cut down the high places. Why? Because they were influences. You know, there's a saying that I read, read, read online that says, you can, if you tell me what a person's reading, what they're watching on TV, what websites they visit, and who their friends are, I can tell you the character they have. And I found that to be true. You know, and I say this from a very, from a ministerial counseling marketing perspective is, everything influences you. I want you to accept this truth. And I want you to tell yourself this. Every single thing influences you. Whether you choose, choose for it to or not. Because it's impossible not to. But are we choosing the right influences? Are we choosing influences that are saying, I want to be like God. How can you be more like God if you choose the wrong ones? You know, I use this example with some kids. And kids get it right away. And I say, if you spent 10 minutes reading your Bible, but then watch a two-hour rated R movie, which one will have greater effect? Kids, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, get the concept. But then we, we think, I'm not influenceable. I'm not influenced. But doesn't the book of Judges, book of, and all the Old Testament, 1 Kings and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles teach us that's absolutely not true. So how do we need to be transformed? This is a passage that changed my life. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. God is calling us to bring about holiness, complete, mature, in our lives, out of fear of God. Do we fear God? Our country doesn't fear God anymore. People don't fear God anymore. But when you understand God is the supreme, perfect, holy being who has all power, who, who has his, my eternity in his hands, should I not seek holiness? And am I purging myself from that which is unholy? Am I being honest and saying, there's some high places in my life. There's some idolatrous shrines in my life that I need to get rid of. I'm going to tell you there a story. When I was growing up, I pretty much watched any and everything. I love watching movies. I still watch movies. If you look at my movie collections, they're now filled with kitty movies and Hallmark movies. You know, because I, I changed that. But growing up, I watched any and everything. And if it was too grotesque or too sexually explicit, I avoided those. But I was thinking, you know what? It's not going to affect me. It's not going to bother me. But then I came across this and I said, do I fear God enough to give up influences? Because we, we, people will say, I'll pursue holiness until it affects my entertainment. Have you thought about that? But my fear of God. And so one of the things when I read this passage, I said, I'm going to change and I'm not going to watch rated R movies anymore. And I got rid of all the movies I had that were rated R. I can tell you it was less than a week that I saw a huge difference in my spiritual life. I was more aware of sin. I was more offended by sin. I was closer to God. I enjoyed holiness. I saw I had joy in my life. Because sin drags you down. It seems pleasurable, but it drags you down. And if you were a Satan, what would you use to manipulate people? And have you seen our society today? It keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And why do we think that is? What's influencing our people nowadays? They're doing exactly what Hitler says. Get all their influences, make them believe they're not being influenced, and then they are influenced. It's really what he said, saying. And he said, if you want to take over a nation, influence the kids. We've got to be careful about our influences. And look at this passage. Romans 12, 1 and 2 gives us this warning. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Our bodies are a living sacrifice. Are you filling your body up with holiness or, or filthiness? 
And when God looks at your body is, and uh, what you're allowing to change and influence your mind, does he see worship or does he see sin? One of the things he tells us is he's telling us right here how to be holy. Do not be conformed by the world. If you're being influenced by all the same things that the world is being influenced by, you're not, you're, all you're doing is being molded and formed. Conformed means being molded and shaped into a certain way. We're just like everyone else. No one sees a difference. We listen to the same things, watch the same things, spend time with the same things. But one of the things that it tells you is renew your mind. Change what you're thinking. Change what's allowing to influence your thinking. Then you'll be holy. Then you'll know the will of God. Then you'll truly worship. You can't worship God and pretend that you're not being influenced by sinfulness if you still gratify that and say, I want to be all those things. You know, we emphasize in this congregation a lot, and I love it, the fruit of the Spirit. But why is, what's the purpose of the fruit of the Spirit? The purpose of the fruit of the Spirit is really to make us like the Spirit. And what is the Spirit? Holy. So the purpose of the fruit of the Spirit is really to help us be holy like the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we can truly worship God. This is why I think we need to get back to holiness. I'm going to tell you a quick story that, I, that really impressed me. I told this story. You know, people don't like this message. Some of you are probably offended or hurt or rolling your eyes. I, you know, I don't care. Um, but here's one of the things that I, I mentioned. I, I taught a lesson on this to teenagers. Teenagers picked it up this real quickly. And do you know what really amazed me about the, some of these teenagers? Because I, I, I never thought this was possible. But I taught this me a message about holiness, and right after, I saw all the kids pull out their iPhones, and they started deleting some of the music from their, from their iMusic. And then some of these kids went home, and I'm not even lying to you, some of these kids went and they said, I'm ton done with being unholy. I'm getting rid of defilement. I want to worship God. They took their Xbox 360s and they went to the GameStop and cashed it out. They cashed in all their games that were incredibly explicit. And I was really proud of them. And I never thought that was really possible. And what amazes me even more, I told you I love these sinful to holy stories. The kids who actually did that are amazing Christians today. Ones I respect incredibly. And in fact, out of all the teenagers that remained faithful, the ones that made the choices to clean out their influences are the ones that are still faithful. I think that's telling. And I think this is what the world needs to hear. We need holiness again because relationship, worship, and fulfillment of our life's purposes cannot be met without the pursuit of holiness. So church family, I want us to realize that holiness is a message of hope. It's a message of blessing. We don't have to live a life of sin that brought hurt and pain to ourselves and our loved ones. But in fact, it allows us to clean the slate, be a new people, to live the best life possible, which is being just like Jesus. Do we love God enough to fear Him, to being holy? Do we choose holiness over entertainment, over sin? This is who we want to be. And just as God is holy, 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 it is my prayer and my hope that when the people of this world and of this community see the Center Road Church of Christ, they will say, just like they would of God, holy, holy, holy. We have been called to holiness. We have been ca called to be like God in His holy nation. So let's make a decision here and now today to be holy as God is holy. At this time, as we're about to sing our song of encouragement and invitation, if you need us to pray for you to, in your holiness, pull one of the elders aside or one of the ministers aside and we'll pray for you. If today you want to be made holy by the forgiveness of your sins, by repenting and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, we give you that invitation now as we stand and sing. This world is